Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have people in globally. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, we have a very exciting lineup discussing the power of storytelling, human rights at home and around the world. My name is Robert Ripberger. I'm a producer director, a proud member of the PGA and the PGA's Social Impact Entertainment Task Force. This is a UN and PGA SIE Task Force's fourth in a series of virtual workshops from the creative community to learn about the UN sustainable goals and explore possibilities for collaborations to make positive social impact entertainment. We chose the following quote for today's session from Antonio Guterres, UN Secretary General. Human rights is our bloodline. They connect us to one another as equals. Human rights are our lifeline. They are, path they are the pathway to resolving tensions and forging lasting peace. Human rights are the front line. They are the building blocks of a world of dignity and opportunity for all, and they are under fire every day. The main goal of today's event is to educate and empower all of you in the creative community to take on this issue and theme in your storytelling projects to create blockbuster impact uh, in, the world and, um, uh, in the world and on the topic of human rights. We've scheduled 15 minutes at the very end for a Q&A, so please post your questions in the Q&A box. And we are very um, honored to have a powerful lineup of guest speakers, first on deep dive, uh, telling the critical stories, followed by human rights defenders, unique stories from the front lines. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Robert Skinner, Chief of Partnerships and Global Engagement in the Department of Global Communications at the UN. Great, thank you very much, Robert. It, it's so great to be here with everyone. And on behalf of the United Nations, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you to this workshop in collaboration with the Producers Guild of America. You know, we're really pleased and honored to be able to work closely with PGA and really happy to be able to be, to be going forward today with this fourth effort in, in this series. And we'd also like to thank all of you for taking the time out of your weekend to join this fourth session of the series, which will showcase how creatives can use the UN as a resource to enrich storytelling and develop effective and social impact entertainment. Today's session will highlight powerful stories of human rights and will answer the question, what's next for storytellers committed to highlighting these stories in the emerging global content market? We have an extraordinary lineup of both UN officials who will share real life stories from the front lines of their work around the globe, as well as film and TV professionals who are producing and promoting projects that feature the most compelling human rights issues facing humanity at home and around the world. Tackling the topic of human rights is no small task. It is one of the three main pillars of the United Nations and one of the principles upon which we were founded. For more than 75 years, UN staff has been working tirelessly to promote and protect the rights and freedoms enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We cannot deny, though, that inequalities, racism, anti-Semitism, and xenophobia, and other human rights challenges persist today. They endure and have even escalated in the face of current challenge, challenges such as COVID-19 and climate change. And of course, it's exacerbated by the vast amount of mis- and disinformation that is constantly coming across our screens. The UN strongly believes that creative thinking and impactful storytelling are crucial to inspiring people to change their mindsets and behaviors. That's why the UN created a special office dedicated to working with you called the Creative Community Outreach Initiative or CCOI. This office and the UN globally across all of our system, across all the sort of vast UN system around the world, we all stand ready to support your productions by connecting you to UN experts for story development and inspiration for stories helping with filming at UN locations or collaboration on social impact campaigns. If you'd like to learn more about CCOI and the work we do, please feel free, feel free to reach out to us. The contact will be put in the chat um, so you'll know how to find us and where to find us. I'm excited today to hear from the exceptional creative professionals today about how they approach the seemingly insurmountable topics around human rights. And I'm also proud that you'll hear from our UN colleagues who will share their stories from the front lines. To kick us off in this fascinating discussion, it is my privilege to introduce you to Mr. Craig McIver. Craig is one of the foremost experts in the field of human rights and the current director of the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights in New York. He has four decades of experience working in the international human rights movement, 
and has undertaken countless human rights missions across Africa, Asia, the Middle East, Eastern Europe, and Latin America. Basically, Craig has covered the world in terms of human rights. We're very lucky to have Craig joining us here today. Without further ado, over to you, Craig. Robert, thank you very much indeed, and thanks to everyone for, for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. I'll just kick us off with uh, a little bit of a framing discussion here. You know, I was remembering when I was preparing for this that it used to be a TV show when I was a kid that began every episode with the quote, there are 8 million stories in the naked city. Well, there are 8 billion human rights stories in the world today because every human being has rights just as every human being has dreams. And there are now human rights defenders standing in solidarity with them in Flint, Michigan, in El Paso, Texas, in the Sudan and in Gaza, in Myanmar and Bangladesh and Bucharest and in Bogota. Every story matters because every human being matters. And those stories are all tiles in the greater mosaic of the story of the international human rights movement that was born at the end of the Second World War. And here's why. The first half of the 20th century was marked by a series of massive failures of governance at both the national and international levels. Among, among the brutal manifestations of this, we, we saw the global colonialist atrocities of the first half of the century, a series of European genocides throughout the same time, Jim Crow and racial segregation in the United States, the ethnic cleansing of indigenous peoples in the Americas, the outbreak of the First World War in 1914, followed by the Great Depression in 1929 and the rise of fascism in the 1930s, World War II in 1939, and the Holocaust in Europe. And after that, the atomic massacres in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, and the birth of both the Nakba in Palestine and apartheid in South Africa in 1948. Across the world at that time, things like education and healthcare and housing and water and sanitation and social security were not rights to which all were entitled without discrimination, but rather they were commodities for sale to those who could afford them or privileges that you had to be born into. And security was defined through the lens of the state, so-called state security, or its wealthy elite, rather than from the perspective of human security of the individual. So that killings and torture and arbitrary detention, rather than being deemed assaults on security, were presented as acts on behalf of security a corrosive idea that again became all too familiar here in the United States after September 11. And then there's that stubborn concept of the other, which exploited by opportunistic politicians and sometimes a complicit media, opens the door to racism and bigotry, profiling and persecution, and ultimately, yes, genocide. And then sovereignty was conceived as a brick wall around the borders of a state within which the state was free to do whatever it wanted to do to its people, and that was nobody else's business. But the big story is that in the wake of all this global madness in the first half of the 20th century, crisis actually opened the way for opportunity, and a new vision was born in 1948. It was fed by a traumatized public, an active civil society, and believe it or not, by some principled people with positions of government power who saw the opportunity to begin to build something new. Eleanor Roosevelt from the US, John Humphreys from Canada, Charles Malik, a Lebanese Arab from Lebanon, and René Cassin, a French Jew, Alexander Bogomolov from the USSR, Peng Chun Chang from China, Charles Duke from the UK, and others. They penned the script for a new global compact which radically redefined the role of governance at the national and international levels. And that script would then be adopted by the entire war-weary and atrocity-scarred world at the UN General Assembly. These were supposed to be the new rules of the game. And that compact rooted in the terms of the UN Charter was called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It was built on three simple pillars. First, that everyone is born free and equal in dignity and rights. That the role of governance at all levels is to ensure freedom from fear and freedom from want for all persons without discrimination and that everyone is entitled to an order in which all their human rights and freedoms can be fully realized, and so these rights must be protected by the rule of law. Well, that's what this work is all about. At the heart of it is this very simple idea that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, and that people, wherever they are and whoever they are, enti are entitled to freedom from fear and want without discrimination on the basis of race, sex, language, religion, political opinion, or any other status. 
And that means that I have the right to be protected from the government that would oppress me, from the criminal that would extort me, from the police officer that would kneel on my, deck, my neck until I die, or the corporation that would poison my water or the climate, that I equally have the right to be free from the fear that somebody will hijack an airplane and crash it into the building and kill me, and to be free from the fear that the government will break down my door in the middle of the night, put me in an orange jumpsuit and throw me into a dungeon on a, in a Caribbean island because it doesn't like my religion or my race or my political opinion or my public criticisms of its activities. And it's the idea that healthcare and housing and water and sanitation and food and decent labor conditions are human rights to which all are entitled, not commodities for sale to those who can afford them, not privileges that you have to be born into, but fundamental human rights that we can claim and realize. Now, of course, that's easier said than done because this work also means struggling with all of the old problems of the last century. None of those have gone away. Racism and colonialism and genocide and torture and slavery and hungry and hunger and untreated disease and then layered on top of all of these are the new challenges of this century, like abuses of technology, mass surveillance, the ravages of climate change, population aging, gross inequalities, economic and otherwise. It is a multi-layered fight for human dignity. Now, if all of this sounds like a non-controversial agenda and something that everyone would agree to, let me tell you, every line that I've just spoken has powerful and well-organized opponents and the other side is highly mobilized today. The human rights vision is only one vision of the way that life should be ordered in our societies, but there are others not based on the values of human rights. The arguments on the other side are based on the values of nationalism, militarism, corporatism, white supremacy, authoritarianism, settler colonialism and imperialism, racism and xenophobia and sexism and homophobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and intolerance of all kinds. So this work is really about a struggle of ideas, a struggle between these competing visions. And the work of the human rights movement is about realizing the vision of human rights that I laid out here today. Our job is to build protection for the vulnerable, redress for victims, empowerment for rights holders, to insist on accountability for perpetrators, but also to build capacities for human rights duty bearers so that they're able to deliver on the rights to which we are all entitled. That, in a nutshell, is the work of human rights, as it's framed by the United Nations. Human rights are universal imperatives to be protected under the rule of law. And building that protection is hard and constant work everywhere. But this is an idea that's been very much under attack lately. Now, of course, it was always the case that human rights were challenged and violated in all parts of the world, north and south. But in recent years, we'd seen something different that is a challenge to the very idea of human rights. The notion that there are many other things that trump your human rights, that there are more important things. And so they say that human rights is a quaint old notion, but don't let it get in the way of borders or national security or counterterrorism or the freedom of the market, or that human rights is only a kind of non-binding rhetorical flourish that certainly cannot outweigh any of those more important priorities in the eyes of those who are in positions of power. Well, that's what the UN Human Rights Program was built for brick by brick for over 70 years now. And I should tell you, because you're in the US, that that blueprint has US fingerprints all over it. It was largely introduced by US actors, US civil society, and a US president. FDR framed the original idea, and Eleanor Roosevelt, as the first chair of the UN Human Rights Commission, laid the cornerstone by shepherding through the adoption of the Universal Declaration. Freedom from fear and want. And since then, this edifice has grown with binding human rights treaties, international monitoring mechanisms, investigations, and assistance projects. Today, in the UN, we have a large independent human rights office and human rights specialists posted in over 70 countries around the world. Human rights monitors and investigators and negotiators and assistance projects fanned out across the entire planet. We have a universal human rights review process that reviews one by one the human rights situation in every country in the world, almost 200 countries today. We have almost 20 human rights treaties, 11 independent country rapporteurs, 44 thematic rapporteurs. To date, we've had more than 50 commissions of inquiry to investigate critical human rights incidents. That's the house that Eleanor Roosevelt and her colleagues laid the foundation for more than 70 years ago. And we think that the idea of human rights and the global infrastructure that's been built to promote and defend it is more relevant and more essential than ever before. 
The challenge for those of us who believe in this mission, wherever we are, is to push back against the pushback that we're seeing today and to work in solidarity to advance the vision that was laid out in the Universal Declaration way back in 1948. That's what the human rights defenders of the United Nations are doing. Now, sometimes that work means you're doing advocacy in a presidential palace or negotiating in a teak lined conference room or lobbying in the halls of a parliament. Other at times, it means that you're kneeling in a cholera infested refugee camp or tiptoeing around the sides of a minefield or collecting evidence in a blood soaked field hospital or standing knee deep in corpses in a mass grave their hands still bound, their wooden faces staring up at you with the horrified expressions of the last moment of their lives frozen in time. In this work, you learn to recognize the scars of torture and abuse, the bloated bellies of the hungry. You learn to recognize the universal scream of human agony, uh, agony and the universal smell of prisons everywhere, that smell of human sweat and urine and despair. But this work also exposes you to the best side of humanity the courage and solidarity and selflessness, the resilience of people and their capacity for humor, even in the face of darkness, the will to resist, not just for oneself, but for others as well. You learn the amazing reality that is often those who are most oppressed, who have the strongest instincts to be just to others. It is often those with the least who are the most generous to others. And that whatever is happening in the face of war and oppression and poverty and brutality of every kind, human beings are capable of laughter, of love, of just getting on with it. And all they want is a recognition of their rights and their dignity as human beings. And just one last point. You may think that you know where the lines are drawn between the two sides in this struggle for ideas, but that's not always obvious. You will find bigots of every variety opponents of economic and social rights, supporters of colonialism, even inside human rights organizations. And you will find some courageous defenders of human rights where you may least expect them, even inside police forces, for example. The truth is that the hard work of human rights happens every day and it happens in every place. But it's also rewarding work, it's meaningful work. I've never regretted making it my work and I dare say that neither have any of the human rights defenders who we'll hear from today. Thank you very much for listening and now back to you, Robert. Thank you so much for your remarks, Craig. Um, yeah, we really appreciate it. Um, and now our first panel, a uh, deep dive telling the critical stories. Again, a reminder throughout, um, uh, please put questions in the chat box and we'll have a Q&A at the very end. And I will now turn it over to Danny, Senior Director of Partnerships and Communication for the United Nations Foundation and our Strategic Advisor to the UN's Creative Community Outreach Initiative. Thanks, Robert. Thank you, Craig. That was incredibly powerful. Just such a portrait of what human rights look like around the world. And um, I'm so happy to be here today. We all agree that part of fighting this battle is actually bringing these stories to light and bringing the people that are living the stories on the ground into the forefront through entertainment to audiences who may not be already hearing about these things. So we've got four incredible um, filmmakers and campaigners with us today. Ayud. Paul, Erica, Bonnie, we'd love for you to join us on screen. Hi. Thank you. So excited to have you here. It's um, human rights. There's been a long, long ongoing struggle and it's, it's as important today as it was when the declaration was written. So just thank you for the work you're already doing and that I know you're gonna to continue to do. We're gonna jump right into it because we only have a half hour and we could use three hours with you. Um, Mayud, I'm gonna to go to you. Um, you actually worked with UNICEF on the ground. You grew up in Iran. You saw a lot of these atrocities uh, firsthand. And then you have taken it to network television with a, a television show that's third, um, third ranking in comedy, uh, bringing in 6 million people a week and surprising you when you, you jump into episode one of season two and you know, the shit's hitting the fan in Afghanistan and you've got a translator there who's trying to get his family out. How did you get to a point of making that show and what did it take to get that to the air? Um, thank you uh, uh, for having us and for having me. Um, I think, uh, like you said, I've spent uh, many years working in conflict zones and, uh, and so, I bring a very specific perspective. I mean, I'm a child of conflict myself. 
Um, I grew up in Iran during the revolution and the war. Uh, I came to the U.S. at the age of 13 and experienced the psychological, emotional conflict of American high school, uh, which probably was the worst conflict I've ever been to, to be honest with you. And uh, I'm not saying that as a joke. Um, it's kind of funny, but it is also true. And, and then uh, I sort of found my way um, back into conflict as a documentarian and a videographer. And then I realized that uh, that wasn't the way to actually make any impact. And, 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 and so sort of pursued a path in pop culture. Um, I mean, to be specific, you know, when, uh, as you said, the shit hit the fan in Afghanistan, which, which had been a few years in the works, uh, uh, and, uh, and unfortunately coming for those of us who had some familiarity with what was happening there. Um, I, 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 had, I had a sort of a dream and nightmare about my Tom working uh, on the ground at UNICEF in Afghanistan in 2002, when they were preparing the backpacks, these blue taupe backpacks that were filled with supplies and notebooks for girls' schools who were going back to school for the first time. And, and I remember uh, sort of with my camera, you know, sh shooting the assembly of these tote backpacks and, and taking them all the way from how they were being assembled at the UNICEF headquarters by Afghans and so the, the UN overseers all the way tracking them to the hands of the girls and then going to school. And, and the nightmare was knowing what was about to happen there and how 20 years of work and all of that energy and goodwill and and beauty that was sort of beginning in that moment that existed despite the circumstances uh, of how we had gotten there and why we'd gotten there was just being sort of uh, uh, shrugged off because of realpolitik and I think this is the you know the why, why I think the work of storytellers is so important you know oftentimes we forget that we're not just entertainers that we have a goal more than that that our job is to to, to, inf to create the emotional and the psychological milieu that allows for the work of the activists and the organizers and the people who are doing the hard work on the ground to actually matter and, and the work, you know, and, and, and we have forgotten that work. You know, we have, uh, uh, as entertainers, as storytellers, we have sort of abandoned our responsibility to ensuring that our stories actually are doing the necessary work to prepare the public for the changes that we want to see you know oftentimes you could you, you, people we're accused of being uh liberal elite and liberals and progressives and yet i don't see much progressiveness when it's very you know when i look at the some of the content that exists in the world and the decisions that are made both by creatives my colleagues but also by executives and and the people that make bigger decisions about what what content gets made and how it gets promoted and what investments are they going to make into it in actually bringing about the kind of progressive environments that we need in order to get past these sort of cycles that we're stuck in you know uh, so it wasn't easy the answer to your question is uh, getting to a place to get you know to uh, you know eight six million viewers a week on an 8 30 prime time thursday night spot uh, on network television was not easy but it was the dream um it, we recognized from very early on myself and my partner Reza Aslan, that uh, if we wanted to make a change and if we wanted to, uh, uh, that we had to sort of get to those that le those kinds of thoughts that, that speak to the part of the public that doesn't necessarily agree with us or even see us as equal as them or as American as they are. Um, and, and so that was a dream. There was uh, many attempts, many failures um, at many levels. Um, and ultimately, you know, the gods aligned the right formulation we had learned enough through pressure uh, and sharpened our skills enough, and we had the right partners at the right time, and uh, and and the work, uh, you know, that you see on television now we can do, you know, which is, which was amazing because to be in a position to actually do this work on a network television where we do 22 shows a week, we're essentially turning shows out week in and week out. We can be responsive in a way, you know, like in a way that most television cannot be, you know, one of the, you know, you get accused of many things. And one of the things you're accused of is that somehow we were involved with the government and the military propaganda because we, we, we made an episode so quickly that responded to what happened in August, you know, that's just network television and 22 up to 22 episodes and, and the nine to five of my life. Um, 
but uh, but yeah, I mean that it took a long time. It wasn't easy, um, and uh, and there is still goodwill and a lot of people who want to do the right thing. And it's just a matter of finding a way to navigate through this crazy uh, entertainment industry business that we're in to be able to be in the right place at the right time. It definitely is. It's pushing a rock up a hill, but thank you for doing that. It was a very powerful episode and opportunity to get insight into something that um, I don't think had been in the form of a sitcom and, and definitely hadn't, hadn't been something I'd seen before. So it was inspiring. And um, Paul, over over to you. Um, you produced Selma, um, When They See Us, Queen Sugar, Middle of Nowhere. You are the president of Eva DuVernay's uh, production company. She said, Paul has been my true and trusted partner for the past decade, the one who takes my dreams off the page and makes them a reality on set and beyond. Um, selfishly for me, Selma, we were taking our boys down to Pettis Bridge and um, showed them Selma. And there were there's no exhibit that can put you in the middle of that experience like the film that you created did. And it's, it is such a powerful example of what it, when you can get inside that human story, how much more you can understand. And then when you stand in that space, how it can come to life. I just kept thinking when I was rewatching it um, and I saw a UN flag in the final march, um, what it must've been like for you standing there on Pettis Bridge. Can you tell us what did it take to get there? And then when was that moment when you actually knew like we're doing this like we're going to do this and it's gotten and then it went on to get the traction it did and the recognition it deserved sure um selma was you know certainly a film that over the years um had a a date on it where um everyone wanted a movie for the anniversary um that was coming up uh and it was such a, a pinnacle moment um, you know, many of the marchers were still alive. John Lewis um, at the time was still alive. And, and, and there was really a, a, a hope and, and dream that this movie could, you know, be made. Uh, that said, um, you know, there hasn't been uh, very big high profile civil rights movies like that. Uh, there hadn't been one made about Dr. King at all. Um, and so there was definitely um, a lot of, of work that had to go into presenting a case on why it should be made, um, how it should be made. Uh, one of the big questions was, could we afford um, in the modern day market to go to Selma and film um, on uh, the Pettus Bridge? And um, to your question, it was probably the first time that we went down and scouted it. Uh, and we stood there and it's somewhat isolated. Um, Selma is, is kind of off, there's no airport there. You, you have to fly into uh, Montgomery and drive. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not an, an easy city in the sense of, of a production crew getting to, um, but we did make the uh, decision to, that there was no way not to film there. Uh, and probably one of the most um, impactful things wasn't even the, the the fact that we filmed it it was when, when we called for extras because we needed hundreds of people to pull the scene off and um, clearly we were going to hire extras from the area many of the people who volunteered to be extras uh, were people who had actually marched um, all those years ago uh, and and what you had was as, as anyone here knows um, in the PGA you have a lot more waiting um, in the filming process than you do filming uh, and so we had hundreds of extras in these cooling tents because it was really hot and they were wearing wool and wigs and all that. Um, and, and as you kind of went around to each of the tents to check on the, the cast and crew, what you found were people telling their stories, uh, what it was like for them when they actually stood there um, on that bridge and what those experiences were. And it was the sharing of, of experiences that um, really, I think, solidified um, the art advocacy of what film is, right? Where we're sharing that experience on film so an audience all over the world can have that experience and hear that story from someone's point of view that they may not glean from a newspaper article or from a, a news clip uh, where you can really get into a character. Uh, and, and so for me, the, the, the real like hardcore moment of the impact of what we were doing was that exchange of the real residents of Selma who had gone through that, who had gone through the terror of that period of time, um, sharing those stories with actors who had to now represent that um, for a wider audience. 
That is so powerful. And when we were there, the, the, the flip of it that we kept thinking was that the other people were there that still live there too. The people yeah. who were on the sidelines and that reality that they just, the hope that they had changed, but the knowledge that that, that, that area, like you said, is so remote and it's still the same in yeah. a lot of ways. Um, so it was, the, what is the lasting impact that you've seen? I would imagine that film has had ripple effects that, that have come back to you. You know, look, voting rights is still such a hot topic. I mean, even today, um, there are bills in many states that are trying to restrict voting rights. And um, I think the lasting impact, unfortunately, is the ongoing conversation of, you know, how do we affect change when it comes to voting? How do we make the, the democratic process accessible and fair to everybody? Uh, and so I hope it's, um, you know, a continuing conversation where, you know, a story from so long ago can apply to the experiences that many have right now and, and maybe um, even solidify their uh, resolution to, to go out and continue fighting to make change. When I was watching it again in the scene with Oprah Winfrey in the beginning of the voter piece, I was thinking this needs to go up again. Like this is disgusting that this is still a thing, but this, this, this clip just needs to be out again right now. For people to be reminded of so well well thank you for that for all the things you do we'll come back again to you but um erica um you your background you've been at abc and nbc and sci-fi and an executive and producer for a long time and um weaving stories it weaving issues into stories like with flight attendant which i binge watched during my covid booster um and you know with the, the battle with addiction <laughs> thank you <laughs> um uh, but you're an interesting moment where there's been this long fight to be able to make powerful content and you get the call from UTA about Malala and, and Apple. What was, what was that like? And, and sort of what are you looking towards as this production deal has taken shape? And I know you can't speak to the specific projects a lot, but um, just. Yeah. Apple where keeps are, the lid on at? us, man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, um, well, first of all, thank you guys so much for having me here. And, and to everyone on this panel, thank you for paving the way for Malala to have the, for Malala and I to be able to do the things that we're trying to do. And look, I will admit when I got the call from UTA about this job, I was like, oh my goodness, Malala. And then I was like, you guys know you have the wrong person, right? Like she needs someone very prestigious and I'm making, I've got a drunk flight attendant and I've got a stalker on you and I've got, you know, and, um, and then when I talked to Malala, her so she loves Rick and Morty and sex education. And, and one of the things, and it goes back to, uh, you know, what Craig said earlier about the capacity for humor in the face of darkness. Like, yes, we want to open hearts and minds. And of course, we want to have something to say, but we want to do it in really fun and surprising ways. And for us, it's not about... Um, you know, we talk a lot about not wanting to define our characters by their trauma. And when you look at, and I think a lot of times when it comes to especially issues of human rights, that people are defined by that one moment or the moment they're in. And, you know, I'm the daughter of Cuban refugee and I'm from New Orleans where Katrina, when Katrina happened and like people still live their lives. They're still falling in love. They're still laughing, you know, during Katrina, everybody was joking about which MRE tasted the best, right? Like in the face of major adversity, people are still people and they're still human and they're messy. And so one of the things we talked a lot about at this company and that we've set out to do and with the things we've got set up and the things we're looking to set up in the future is fearless stories with human characters. And we want them to be a little chaotic and a little sloppy because it feels like there is this requirement on characters who have gone through something or who are not living the traditional cis straight white experience where they have to be defined by that trauma. And we talk a lot about, and no shade to Mad Men, great show, but like Don Draper. If you ask someone to describe Don Draper, they would say he was an advertising executive, an alcoholic, a womanizer. They would go through a very long list before they got to, oh, right. And he stole somebody's identity during the war. But if you have a character who's a refugee or a character who's a survivor of trauma, it's, the temptation is there in entertainment to make that the sole focus. 
as opposed to all their other nuances. And so I think for us and, and you know, and, and my like with Al, I think like, thank you for that. And, you know, Paul, everything you guys have done to add that dimension. And, and that's what's important to us is the same, you know, Malala just got married and people sometimes see her still as a small child and she's a woman now. And I think in that same way, but she's defined by that moment. And so that's one of the things we're really setting out to do specifically with women of color is to define them by who they are as people and dimensionalize them. And unfortunately, I feel like that's a human right that doesn't get covered as much as entertainment because it feels, you know, people are that call to action to make it so important can sometimes strip away the humanity. And so that's something that's very, very important to us and what we're trying to do with Apple. That's fantastic. And I think you're right. This group has done that so well of creating these characters that have even even with Martin Luther King, like the there's the, the, the 360 on who these people are Absolutely. In, in this. It's not just the straight forward and Al. I mean, there, I, I, I just want to quickly say that the hey, thanks, Erica, for the call and, and congratulations to Malala. I did not know. That's lovely to hear. Uh, and uh, but uh, but conflict zones are funny places. And that's a weird thing to say. But anyone who's ever been to a conflict or lived in an environment that's been under duress, um, whether it's here in America or elsewhere, what you find is that people are super funny and they live such dynamic lives and they have such three dimensionality. And we strip them, we make them invisible by doing exactly what Erica said. It is just not true. It's not that we're making up, you know, we're adding fun to something that is tragic. No, these people are not defined by their tragedy. These people are defined completely differently and they refuse. You know, Sarajevo was one of the funniest experiences I've ever had in my life. It was also one of the most terrifying. And, uh, uh, but people were unbelievably funny and, and, and party, you know, to the last minute. I mean, it's unbelievable, but that's essentially the way people respond to conflict is, is through humor. And that is also the way we need to demonstrate it through humor and life and vitality and all of those things. So thank you, Erica, for saying that. It's really important. Thank you. And, and Bonnie, um, would love to, to, to bring you into the conversation. You've been in this game of impact producing and impact campaigning for over two decades, we go back a long way um, from your days at Participant with Food Inc. and Blood Diamond and sort of taking and adding the tools on the toolbox to powerful content to extend the change. How have things changed? How have they stayed the same? And you know, what's working now that maybe started back when you were doing things like Blood Diamond? Thank you uh, all for having me. It's a real honor. Before I jump into that question, a very quick PSA. Um, which uh, I agree with everything with, uh, with what um, Mayad said about Afghanistan. And there is a documentary short right now called Three Songs for Benazir, which is shortlisted for an Oscar. It's on Netflix. And it, to me, it's a very important short doc. I've already sent it to the UNHCR, sent it to a friend of mine, the Afghan desk at the State Department and sent it to a number of NGOs. And it really shows in, in a very nuanced, very powerful way the experiences of a family that is currently living in an IDP camp. And as we know, there's about 97% starvation levels right now in Afghanistan, it's winter. I was involved and still involved in the evacs of a number of high profile Afghans who are on the Taliban kill list. And I think that this is a movie that is a perfect example to educate and mobilize the public to support the efforts of the United Nations and the UNHCR on the ground in Afghanistan. So that's the end of my PSA. I just wanted to, you know, I appreciate what, uh, what Maya had said and I wanted to just support that, that this is a really important short documentary that could I think help with UN efforts. So um, yes, I ran the Blood Diamond campaign and that was in 2006, Danny. And I've seen um, the impact ecosystem just really grow. Um, Amnesty's always had a great relationship and I ran the Artist for Amnesty program at Amnesty International. And we had a monthly bulletin that we would send out to studios, to cable companies, to networks that talked about our prisoners of conscience, um, people at risk, 
our campaigns, all the issues that we worked on in collaboration with the UN. So we worked very collaboratively with the entertainment community. They came to us for research, they came to us about our cases. And uh, with Blood Diamond, you know, that is still discussed. It's actually taught in schools now, which, you know, I was very pleased to hear because it is a campaign that has had both short and long-term impact. And with that campaign, just to speak very quickly and then go to the, um, the landscape now, is we were never about boycotting diamonds. We wanted to educate the public about the Kimberly process and make sure that if they were going to buy diamonds that they demand that they be conflict free. And to go to these jewelers and say, show us the certification that you are not actually selling a blood diamond. And we mobilized Amnesty's um, large grassroots membership around the world to support the film we developed a curriculum that went into schools. And before Valentine's Day, we deployed thousands of, actually I think it was between 10 and 20,000 people around the world to go to these jewelry stores. We encouraged moms to take their kids. We had high school students, we had professionals showing up at these jewelry stores. And as consumers, as um, buyers were going in, we would say to them, be, be a conscious consumer here. Here's a downloadable guide. This is what a blood diamond is go in and ask if they can prove that it is not a blood diamond, that they have the certification for it. And it was a hugely successful campaign. And um, full credit to Warner Brothers and Ed Zwick. Amnesty was partnered with Global Witness on this campaign. They said, do what you need to do here to get the message out. And so that movie was able to reach even a larger group of people because the human rights community activated around it, went outside to their own networks and said, you have to support this film. You have to understand what this is. And we have to make sure that the public, um, you know, will play the role of a conscious consumer in demanding that if they're gonna buy any diamonds, that they be certified. And now that's part of the, uh, the popular lexicon. People know what a blood diamond is and they use that term for blood chocolate, blood minerals, blood gold. And, uh, you know, to this day, when I, whenever I speak at conferences, people come up to me and they say, see this diamond, it's conflict free, or it's synthetic. And I made sure that, you know, I wasn't, um, you know, being someone who wasn't aware of human rights, and I wanted to show the support. So, and back then, when we launched that campaign, we don't have the social media now, back then that we have now, you know, we literally had to rely on our grassroots uh, activists reach them through emails, reach them through phones, and Facebook had just started. And now, of course, um, impact campaigns because of participant. You know, they they started with very aggressively talking about social action campaigns and very successfully. And I worked there as well. And now, you know, everybody talks about social impact campaigns. People want them: studios, streamers cable companies, networks, from feature films to doctor series, understand the value of it in engaging what could be a wider audience and really mobilizing them to move the needle. And that's what so many filmmakers want. And obviously they want their movie seen, they want it to be a commercial success, they want it to be a critical success, but they also want to say that we actually move the needle on these issues. And Ava does that brilliantly, you know? I mean, with 13, with when they see us, you know, and so many are probably, that's what we do. And this entertainment community is so critical in this role to educate the public and to mobilize the public. And so I have seen this landscape grow in the last 20 years, as you and I have, Danny, where people are saying, well, what is, you know, an impact campaign to now saying we want an impact campaign. And I'm so grateful to see so many impact companies and impact producers. Well, thank you, Ed Has. It's exciting just in pulling the panel together to see all the work that's been done. and. As I suspected, our time is running so short. Um, just as as an ending spot, business entertainment, you know, telling stories, doing the right thing, having a purpose, it's it's a conflict. Are there any any tips or tools that you would recommend to folks who are watching when it comes to how can you hold on to your voice and 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 also make it to market so that you can have an impact if there's a it's a large question with a little bit of time, but if there's <laughs> any top line thoughts on that thing you hold on to when you're fighting the fight and it's not, it's not, um, and it's not easy. I have a cheat code and we'll see if it works, but so far what's worked is kind of finding your way around what your buyer needs. And for us, we're exclusive to one buyer. And so we know that our buyer wants big, high concept, wants 
A-list actors, like AA-list actors. And so when we're trying to elevate new female voices of color, that can be hard. And so one of the things that we've done is work really hard to find partners that are traditionally impressive, that also want to help us boost that agenda. And I think that, you know, finding ways to, again, take that high concept uh, idea and elevate, like, and sneak in your agenda has been helpful because did they pass in our piece in the 1100s about Muslim women? Oh, yeah, they sure did. And it was set in the 1100s, like, and so that was not a total shock. Um, but but for us, when we can come in with an A-list producer and somebody that they like, it's been about that. I know that's harder for emerging voices. I have the, the secret weapon of Malala, which is very helpful. But um, I do find really listening to the buyers to, instead of forcing your way through, finding something that achieves both agendas has been really helpful for us. And, uh, let me just quickly jump in and just to say that uh, what I've what you know over the years, uh, like Bonnie, I've been involved in a, a number of social social impact campaigns since two thousand five, and and uh, and the the lesson that I took out of that I've put into an, uh, a, an initiative called Starfish. But I think the, the key findings that that define Starfish are the fact that you bring in the mission into the DNA of the project as opposed to. Mm -hmm. um, try to wing it yourself. You know, oftentimes artists and writers are sort of working in solo, trying to you know do all of this work. You're not alone anymore. That you can reach out to the people who are actually actively working on the issues and 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 bring them into the process of creativity. And you can bake those things into the into the DNA of the project, so that when you're selling it, you're free from trying to advocate, um, and that you could talk about the change you want the, the project to impact in the world, as opposed to the issue you're trying to specifically attack because then those things are built into the characters and the nuances of the story already and they're going to become a lot more difficult to tear apart and so um, that's a that's an invitation that I don't think many artists and creators know that that is open to them is that there are a lot of organizations out there that now have divisions that are entertainment focused and are being created to work with them and you can whether you're taking on the environment or whatever issue you're taking on engage that early on in the process with them to make sure that those issues are baked in. I'd like to just add, I can agree 100%. I am the advocate for the NGOs. I worked at an NGO. You know, they're the ones that are doing the day-to-day life-saving work on the ground and moving the needle. And you're right, they now all have these artist relations division. And I think it's critically important for filmmakers you know, and the entertainment community to engage with those grassroots organizations as early as possible to help with, with the script and you know, to help in the development process, to make sure that these stories are authentic and then fully engage them through an entire campaign. And, and Mayad, you also uh, said that you're, oh, I'm so sorry, Paul. I was gonna kick it to you for the final word. Oh, no, was, I'm sorry. Um, I was gonna I'm say, gonna, yeah. go ahead. Mayad mentioned his writer's room has a combination of comedy Jedis with Afghan uh, folks with soldiers, which I thought was interesting also just tactically to, to tying it to Erica's point of combining the pieces of the puzzle. But to you, Paul, for the for the final word for our panel, please. Sure. I was going to say, you know, obviously um, there are a lot of different strategies as you sell a project, but I don't want to take the importance away from no matter what the show is, no matter what the movie is, you can add characters and stories into anything that represent many of these um, uh, uh, topics in a way that are just more natural. Um, you know, as you cast characters um, for an episode, you know, add in some of these stories. It doesn't have to be, you know, this global um, um, idea that you're selling a show about one thing where we're representing the world and, and these topics kind of um, interweave in our daily lives and in the daily lives of our characters. Uh, and so a lot of times it can even be more subtle to add those uh, those stories in and 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 allow for those voices to be heard in, in ways and in, in different shows that people may not see them coming. That, that is so true. Um, and, and just thank you. This has been such a pleasure. I'm sad it has to come to a close as I could talk to you for another half hour. 
Um, but thank you for all you've shared. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Excited to see all the work you're about to do. Um, and we'll be we'll be continuing to watch all that that you bring to the marketplace. And we're going to close and kick it over to Anne Marie Gillen, who is going to uh, start our next panel. Thank you. Wonderful to be here for the second panel. Wow, that was inspiring to hear from all the successes of our fellow producers and creatives. And um, as Rob Skinner mentioned earlier, if you need assistance from the UN, if you have stories, ideas, or questions, you can email them directly. And the email was put into the chat. It's really simple, creative at un.org. So um, I wanna welcome everybody to our second panel today, Human Rights Defenders, Unique Stories from the Frontline. And right after this, we'll have uh, 15 minutes for Q&A, and you can post your questions at the Q&A button. Um, I'm Anne-Marie Gillen. I'm co-founder of the Social Impact Entertainment Task Force at the Producers Guild. And I am beyond honored to be able to moderate this next panel of what, for me, are the real heroes on the front lines of human rights worldwide. They face the harshest of the harshest. They show strength, bravery, humility, and they're gonna be graciously sharing with us their own personal stories of their journey with the UN, as well as the people they have met along the way. And as our keynote touched on, you know, these specific frontline stories are of resilience and have what the least uh, are giving the most generous and, and even laughter. So I know they're gonna to touch, move and inspire all of us. So without further ado, if my panelists would all unmute and open your video. Um, Chitra Massey, who is coordinator, Partnerships and Outreach for Social Justice at the UN, Human Rights. Ravina Shandasani, spokesperson, uh, UN Human Rights. Uh, Chris Muboru, and for, for 20 years, he was the senior human rights advisor, but he currently is head of the UN office in the Republic of Congo. And finally, Fiona Fraser, who's head of human rights at the UN assistance mission in Afghanistan. So to kind of to jump off, and I know Craig addressed it well in his keynote, but I think it's an excellent starting point, just in a sentence or two uh, to kind of um, give the language of what human rights means. You know, um, what does it mean to you on the front lines? Can you demystify it for our audience from your point of view? And Ravina and Fiona, if you would jump in and address that, that would be great. Um, Fiona and Ravina, there you go, Ravina, you're unmuted now. We, we, you know, we were trying to give each other the floor, but, but I'll go ahead and start. Uh, okay. And Marie, I, I told you the story of uh, when in 2004, in the aftermath of the Southeast Asian tsunami, I went to India to, the, to a town called Nagapatnam. Um, and to me, that just encapsulates the importance of human rights language. Um, I went to an IDP camp where people who had lost everything, their homes had been washed away, everything, refrigerators, children, um, everything washed away, their livelihoods, their, their fishing vessels. Um, they're in this IDP camp. And over there, there was a big board that said, you have the right to food. You get you know, a kilo of rice, this much oil, this much lentils every day, and you have the right to these. Now to a lot of people, the right to food, economic, social, cultural rights, they sound like empty words, but to people who had lost everything, who, had, who were in this position of vulnerability, to then not have to feel like you have to beg and that you have to, you know, that it is a privilege um, for you to be able to receive um, these uh, uh, necessities of life, but to be able to go and claim them as entitlements, I felt it was a very powerful um, kind of reminder um, that they still had their dignity and they still had their rights for them. So just the importance of using rights language. Excellent. Fiona, anything to add to that? Well, I think um, the key thing is, as uh, Ravina said, I mean, I think, I mean, language, I think is very important. And I think as human rights folks, we often get sort of wrapped up in our uh, often legal and uh, conventions and um, so forth language. And I think we need to really simplify and use language that is meaningful for everybody. Um, I think also, so I mean, as Ravina said, you know, it boils down to the basics that we all, many of us take for granted you know, having a, food, having a roof over one's head, having a meal on the table, being able to send a child to school, having good health care. And it becomes meaningful, I think, to people, human rights, it's a, two words that are often banded about, that 
too much um, without really people thinking, I think, at times what it really means. And it does become meaningful when you lose something, when you think you don't have access to things I've said, or when you're detained, um, when you're locked up, no one knows where you are, when relatives have no clue um, where um, somebody who's been disappeared. So I think we, as the human rights community, I've always felt we need to use language that actually people can relate to, have some meaning. And, um, and that can be for many, for many different phases. I mean, you know, when the way we talk to somebody who's a victim, the way we talk to relatives, the way we will talk to a government, the way we will talk to an armed group, all it's a different sort of way of, of talking. And I think it's one of the most um, challenging things at times of being a human rights officer is how we choose our words and express ourselves in trying to address and protect um, people's human rights. Excellent, thank you, Fiona. Um, I'm gonna jump around from what we talked about in our interviews a little bit, but the questions are pretty much the same, but I really wanna get into some of the stories. So um, I'd like for each one of you to share with us someone um, or some memory you still think about a lot a story you wish the world knew and, and why it has stuck with you. Maybe we'll start with um, Chitra on that one. Okay, I was just uh, <clears throat> thinking that, you know, over a course of time, I think that we are a very privileged lot. We have the privilege of being welcomed in a country because we work for the UN. People give us a lot of respect and we are able to sit down and sort of say, we are here to help you without sort of having anything to offer in terms of our credibility, except for the fact that we come with the flag of the UN and it is the UN organization and what the UN stands for that brings about this change where people are willing to share their innermost thoughts, experiences and fears with us. So I think for me, uh, there have been many, many, many inspiring people. And when I think of what stories I, 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 I can think of many, many, many stories and, you know, but I want to choose a very small and a very funny story to tell you that has stayed with me. Afghanistan, I have a sense of deja vu now. And I can understand what Mayad is saying, because at the time, Mayad, that you were there in Kabul, in UNICEF, I was there in Bamiyan in 2002. And there was a moment of great excitement, so much positivity and engagement. And during this time, still there were challenges around women's rights. And I remember an incident where a woman from the Hazara community, um, Khanum uh, Sabira Saki, was sitting in the mosque. And we were waiting for the Molana to come, who was a little bit late. And there had, a lot of people had gathered in there. So there was this entire community of men sitting on the men's side. And with a short wooden panel, there was a, the women's side on a smaller, much smaller group. And she started talking loudly in Dari about women's emancipation, women's rights, and why it was women, important for women to stand up and claim their rights and their space. And it was a very sort of hilarious moment at the same time, because you had a group full of men who would probably never listen to this conversation, but were forced to because of the circumstances that they were sitting in a mosque and nobody wanted to be disrespectful. And here you had this woman's voice, one lone woman's voice in her 40s, late 40s, sweeping across the entire room, talking about why women's rights were important and women needed to stand up for themselves. And the men folk in their family needed to support them. <laughs> it's just a story I wanted to share because for me, this was wonderful. It broke all the stereotypes that you think of women being fearful, not being able to speak because you had heroes from everyday walks of life and we were lucky and privileged to meet and engage with them. I'll stop here. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Chitra. Chris, is there a, a special story you'd like to share with us that still sticks with you? <clears throat> yeah. I, I have lots of stories. I don't have the time to share them, maybe in my memoirs at some point. <laughs> in the future. Because it's really, it's, it's, it's really, my life is dominated by these kinds of stories that stuck with me. I'll give you a very um, dramatic example of, I started my career, my real human rights career in Sierra Leone at the height of the civil war. 
And I just can't tell you what I observed there in terms of human rights uh, violations, major atrocities, and, and, and also cases of bravery of these people who just withstood the odds um, to, 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 to get their countries moving back on. In Sierra Leone, I, I, I just remember this story of, you know, talking to this 12 year old boy holding a massive Kalashnikov, you know, double the size of his body. And um, his, he had been forced to uh, kill almost everybody in his village to prove that he was uh, he was entitled to be to be drafted into the forces, and he would, they were desperately poor. All he wanted was was somebody to believe in him, a pack of cigarettes, food, and and he had been forced to, to he had been dehumanized because that is how you you you, you the rebels did to make sure that this 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 war was executed with the most amount of brutality to try and have the government uh, bend uh, to the rebel demands. And um, so you imagine this boy, he has no idea what he's doing. He, he, he is high on drugs. He doesn't, um, he has committed atrocities that he will never understand in his lifetime. And yet he believes he's talking about bringing back democracy. Obviously that is somebody who's totally brainwashed um, and, 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 and just how do you set back this person? And the kind of atrocities that were there in, us, in Sierra Leone were so um, horrible. I mean, it was my first real um, uh, uh, meeting of these uh, situations. People whose hands had been amputated because they had attempted to vote. And um, so it was, it was just very shocking. I met a woman in Sierra Leone. Uh, we were asked by the rebels to go and talk to them. We were thinking about peace talks. And they said, you have to come and miss, meet us in a, in, a, in a bush camp. And we had to, to, to fly a helicopter in a, in a, in a very, on a very dangerous mission where we could have been shot down any minute. But the rebels, we believed in the rebels who were killing their own people that they would not shoot us down. We arrive at this um, camp and we had been told about mass rapes. <clears throat> and this woman who was so outspoken talked to us on behalf of the women in that camp, trying to give a picture of how nice the rebels are saying, we are being treated well, the UN should go back home. You don't understand what we are going through. And then the moment the rebels can they are back and went to inspect something. The woman knelt down and told me, save us, we're being killed. And I was raped last night. So really massive, massive uh, cases of suffering. I remember the faces of this, that scared woman in Eritrea when um, there was the war between Eritrea and Ethiopia and the UN was called to go into the, into the front line. And this woman uh, said, I had such a story that I just couldn't continue working without, I just got transfixed on her. She had yeah. just gotten married in Ethiopia and the night she got married and was, she was supposed to go with her um, Dutch husband to Holland, she was arrested as an Eritrean, taken to Eritrea, a country that she had never lived in. And all she wanted was to go back and get reunited to her husband and go to Holland, start a life. Here she was stranded in a country that she knew nothing about. She was arrested only because she had an Eritrean last name. And finally, this woman in Uganda, whose son had just been abducted by the rebels and she didn't know, I didn't know what to do for her. She didn't know what to ask of me. I just sat there holding her hand to just listen to her story. So these stories are out there and I just wonder why they don't get told. We have so many of them out there. Yeah, I think they don't get told because we don't know. And that's why panels like this are so uplifting and so important. I know in talking with um, uh, Fiona, you had a kind of a, an uplifting approach when you were with the Ukraine and working with the detainees and all those letters and deliver. Could you talk about that story? Would you mind telling that a little bit? That was so oh, heartbreaking and heartbreaking. Yeah, so as, you, 
So as we said, Anne-Marie, um, we, um, as the OHCHR Human Rights Office, we worked in Ukraine, both sides of the um, confrontation line. And um, we were working with uh, detainees, also with uh, detainees, the families of detainees. We had access to the detention facilities on the government control side. For many, for we did, we had a great difficulty in getting access to the detention facilities controlled by the armed groups um, in the eastern part, um, what's known as uh, Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic. The key, the story, the, the what happened is we got access um, to one particular um, detention facilities. We found um, a, a number of uh, men, both civilian actually, and also members of who'd been part of the Ukrainian army. They hadn't, nobody had seen them. Um, and we um, spoke to them very, very briefly due to the circumstances. But one of the things we said to them is if they'd write, like to actually write because they had no communication with their family on the other side of the confrontation line, if they'd write to write a letter, uh, they did. Some were reluctant, but the majority did. Um, and we took the letters um, and we took them back across the contact line with colleagues, we decided that we, over the next 48 hours, we would ensure that each family member got the letter. Ukraine's a large country. Um, one of us drove sort of through the night. Um, I, I was part of uh, one group and um, I remember, you know, I can remember now the man who'd given us the letter, he was very reticent, rather standing in the, the back of the cell. Um, and, and he wrote his letter and I remember when you know we gave we found finally his wife and um, she'd had no word of him for a couple of years and you know just it was very emotional being the one who comes in and is the one who's seen her husband and is actually being the one who is handing over evidence that her husband uh, is still alive she wanted to know how he looked you know, and showed me sort of all the photographs of the, when he was, when they got married and so on. So highly emotional, but I think that really for me, what, what it means, this story is, well, what happened is, you know, it was about, um, we, we were dealing with people on both sides of the contact line who'd been separated, families destroyed. Um, and this was a little bit of bringing some hope and um, a little bit of, yeah, sort of just making it a, a contact between people, somebody who they thought they had lost at the end of the day. Yeah, wonderful. I, it's so touching to hear that. And that's a little bit about that 360 that they were talking about earlier, that it isn't just victimization stories. And Ravina, one of the things that you had brought up was really about uh, the victims versus the perpetrator. And it isn't so well defined. It's kind of black and white. Can you give an example of that? It's. Um, I think uh, some of, one of the previous panelists made the case uh, very clearly. It's. It's very rarely black and white. Human beings are multidimensional, um, and there are many different aspects. Um, no, in fact, just one story comes to mind. Um, in so I was in Kananga, which is in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in the, in the center. Um, and this is when there was a, a major ethnic conflict going on, um, mass killings, mass graves, um, all of that. And our office was on the ground doing training for police officers um, and for the army as well. And they also had a train the trainer approach. Um, and in these circumstances, sometimes justice and accountability is complicated. You cannot hold each individual perpetrator accountable immediately. And sometimes you have to work with, you know, the, the, the very, the FARDC, the, uh, the armed forces of the um, Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as the police. Um, there was this one particular policeman who's, who's always stayed with me. He identified um, that the taxi motor drivers, so these are motorcycle taxis that people take um, to go around, he said, those are very important um, gatherers of evidence for us. They witness a lot of things. Um, and especially when it comes to sexual violence or abductions of women, um, because the way that a lot of these uh, um, armed forces, the state security forces get around is in, on the taxi motors. Um, so he decided that he wanted to do a human rights training for these taxi moto drivers to get them to become human rights defenders and to get them to come and you know, inform him immediately when they suspect that something's not quite right. Um, and it was one of the most powerful moments. I was sitting there on these foldable chairs on the pavement and all these taxi motor drivers come around. And this guy, like a preacher, is talking to them about human rights using our language and saying, this guy gets on the back of your car 
you know, this soldier um, with this beautiful woman. She's so beautiful that you actually want to reach back and you kind of want to grab, but are you supposed to grab? And they all go, no, is that human rights? No, what are you supposed to do? Here, take my card and WhatsApp me when you come across a situation like this and we will take care of the situation, you know, bring him to me and you have the power um, to stop these human rights violations from taking place. So it was very much um, recruiting and empowering people mm -hmm. who are part of the community to be able to prevent violations and to be able to advance accountability for violations. And, and that to me was, it, yeah, just a very powerful um, example of um, just local resources and, and how nuanced the picture can be. Right, right. So, so important to really have the UN participating with you and have the advisors, et cetera, because it's it's a very complicated issue. And um, I know Fiona, you're calling from Kabul, Afghanistan. And, and I know you can't really discuss your current work there right now, but I think you had something really important to offer our audience about working with the UN early on in development of our stories. Well, I mean, I think, um... There are a number of people on this um, panel, uh, on this call, who who have a, obviously a huge amount of experience um, in Afghanistan. I think the key thing for me right now, we're we're in a very very um, specific situation, and it's we it's absolutely critical that a human rights presence remains in the country. We are there is so much that needs to be. Um, monitor to use a human rights word to be documented and to be really but most importantly it's about being there for the people I mean it sounds very big worldy but you know human rights is about people at the end of the day and we're here to listen to offer solidarity as was said um, earlier on to be the eyes and ears about what is going on sometimes we can speak out sometimes it's harder to um you know, speak out because of protection issues for individuals and their families. Um, but we need to find ways, um, whatever the circumstances, to find little creek cracks in the door to move forward and really ensure that, you know, at the end of the day, people have their uh, rights, whatever they may be across the spectrum, uh, unprotected. So I think for me, um, having a human rights presence in any country is extremely important to really know what is actually going on in that country. Right, and, and, uh, you, and to be able to see and speak directly with the people in that country is so important. And if we as creatives are gonna be telling those kinds of stories, we don't have that access. And we definitely want to be working with people like yourself in the UN on the front lines, because we can do more harm than good if we're not dealing with it appropriately. And I think that was a point that you and I had talked about that I thought was so, so important. Um, so while wow, we're coming to a close here, I'm gonna go over as they did in the last one a little bit, cut into the uh, Q&A or the Q&A will go over a little bit as well because you know what you have to tell us is just so fascinating. So um, one of the things that we realized and, and, and we're hearing it throughout this our session, the earlier session, the idea that a lot of these stories can be about victims and heart wrenching and hopelessness, but we really want to show the 360. So I'm just wondering, does anyone have a fun story, a laughter story, a redemptive story you'd like to share with us? Well, we have um, what we call victory stories, uh, okay. which is we, which are great, and this is what in human rights we really. Um, <clears throat> value, um, you know, uh, cases like in, 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 in Sierra Leone and Liberia where the victims were able to um, take the perpetrators to justice. And as a result, uh, there, was, um, there, was, uh, there was justice for the victims. Uh, but we also have, um, you know, other stories that really should be told. For example, Craig talked about stories that are not necessarily what we call civil and political rights, but they're, also, they're economic and social, like the right to education, what is happening, um, you know, teachers who are making great strides, making sure that children who have no access to computers can learn during this epidemic. 
Um, we have a big um, thing that I want to introduce people to in terms of uh, the environment, for example, that we have uh, big challenges. The, right now we have two, what we call the two lungs, ecological lungs of the world, the Amazon and the Congo Basin. We have activists who are making sure that people can leave uh, for the next 50 years because they have a clean environment, which by the way was declared by the Human Rights Council as a fundamental human right. And I've posted something uh, mm -hmm. on the chat. So they're, they're good stories. It's not all morose. We have stories which make us happy, which make us laugh, which make us wake up in the morning and uh, continue the struggle. Excellent. And um, Chitra, you actually had um, a little, uh, photo montage to show us. So I'd like Diane to show that real quick. It's, it's very, very short, but it has a lot of your personal photos of actually working in the field in Iraq and Afghanistan and Nepal, et cetera. Um, and while she does that, you know, is, is there a fun story you'd like to share? Sure, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, maybe I'd begin with um, the fact that very often it's true. We uh, hear a lot of uh, heartbreaking stories and we have a lot of heartbreaking experiences but at the same time you know when you asked us to think about what we'd been doing I have to say that there was a moment of absolute gratitude because uh, mm. there's been so much humor resilience there's been so much joy and craziness that we've experienced at the same time so uh, I, I was thinking about the time in Afghanistan where we were, it was like minus 30 degrees and we were all determined we wanted to get our cable television going. So we were all taking turns dressing up in like all the gear going up on the roof and trying to twiddle and turn the, uh, you know, uh, antenna around to be able to get in and none of us lasted more than maybe 30 seconds or a minute and then we take turns and keep doing it. So there were a lot of crazy moments like this, but I'd like to share a story from Tanzania, actually. One of my most memorable moments is that I started working with a small group of um, creative artists, young people who were producing a program called Ubongo Kids. Mm -hmm. And in our conversations, they introduced a new character called Amani. And Amani was a young little girl who had albinism. And through that program, which was reaching out to all of East Africa, teaching children maths and arithmetic and saving and all of these things, we introduced a character called Amani who had albinism and who was living with albinism and spoke and shared about what was the problem with her skin, why she needed sunglasses, why she needed to have a floppy hat on, mm -hmm. and therefore encouraged a whole generation of children who understand, understood that these are not ghosts, these are young children who just have a genetic um, uh, modification that has resulted in, 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 in this yeah. situation for them. And for me, I think that was one of the most positive outcomes that we had. Excellent, I mean, it really demystified it. It's, I mean, Jean, I think it's Gina Davis, if you can see it, you can be it. So it's, you know, that's so powerful. Uh, when you're in doing storytelling. Uh, we're, we're over already, but I'm going to give you each 20, 30 seconds and just one last question, one story, one piece of information or one call to action you would like to leave our audience with. Well, just really quickly, um, just to, do, again, as you said, to demystify, uh, you know, human rights work doesn't have to be heroic. Um, it's, it doesn't have to be very grandstanding. Um, one story of uh, when the pandemic hit and, you know, a lot of children worldwide went online um, to, to study and those who didn't have internet connections, you assume, oh, well, um, they can't. These two women, these two teachers in uh, Jamaica got a blackboard and a chalk and went into the community and just put the homework of the children on the blackboards and the children would come with their notebooks and uh, take down the work and go home. Some of the children were thrilled, others were not so happy that they still had to do their homework. But at the end of the day, human rights work does not have to be heroic and grandstanding. Sometimes it just takes a blackboard and some chalk. <laughs> I love that, that simplicity, yes. Chris? For me, I just wanted to say, um, filmmaking can have a significant impact on um, social issues and human rights issues. And I am a living witness because I have been pushing for the right to education for many years. I started a foundation 
in uh, Kenya that uh, promotes the right to education. And many kids have been totally marginalized as a result of lack of education. They can't even begin enjoying the other range of rights. And so this is a big issue. But when uh, we did a documentary that is called A Small Act, I'm going to post it here. Um, there was a significant reaction that resulted in us getting a lot of funding and a lot of uh, support for the kids in Kenya. Um, so they, 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 there's real impact in storytelling through movies and documentaries. Excellent. Well, um, we've gone over, um, but we'll go over a little bit. Oh, did Chitra, did I miss you? Oh, yes, I'm I just so sorry. <laughs> I, I have to say that I cannot agree more with Chris. You know, when, when I was thinking of what I wanted to say, I wanted to leave you with three, three taglines. The power of cinema. As someone who is, by the way, I loved Selma, but I am a big Bollywood fan. And I have to say that the power of cinema was brought home to me in multiple duty stations, conversations with cab drivers, an icebreaker with politicians, it, it is amazing how cinema opens up doors. And just as a little footnote, someday I'll tell you the story of how I was the coordinator of Bollywood Nights in Baghdad. <laughs> and I had, I had very wonderful outcomes as a, part, as a part of that social evening that I had put together. In the time of COVID, I think there is no doubt we are talking about inequality. And this is something I think Craig touched upon, and it's a fundamental thing that we really need to work on. And then I want to take you with me, you know, Hollywood and film industry all over the world has very much been in the Pacific. I mean, I can think of Anaconda, I can think of Tom Hanks on a little island there, but I really want to take you, if I could, on a visual journey with me to the village of Wunidongoloa that I visited and I will never forget that haunting scene of standing there with small kids and they're pointing out in the distance, oh, that used to be the village cemetery, it's gone under. That used to be our school. And every day you see that salt water incursion and incursion into coming in inwards and inwards and houses just floating away and falling apart. Yeah. And, I, and I just want to say that for me, these three things come together very strongly and there are women human rights defenders in the Pacific facing phenomenal challenges. And I think that sometimes it really sadden, saddens me, but also angers me that we somehow seem to forget about the Pacific. I mean, including when you look at the news and the climate change, Tonga made it as this little, little line beneath the news saying, you know, there's been volcanic eruption and a tsunami. That's about it. It didn't even make it to the main news mm -hmm. until much later. But I think that there are things there that we really need to look at and Excellent. we really need to do more. Yes, we do. And hopefully you have inspired this audience of producers and creatives to take on some of these issues and these stories. And I just want to thank all of you so much for the generosity of your time. And I mean, people are calling from the Congo and Kabul and it's very late in the evening. And again, acknowledge you for your important work. And I'm going to hand it over now to Will Nix who is going to deal with our Q&A and closing comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anne-Marie. In honor of his birthday this week, I'd like to uh, begin this segment with a quote from Martin Luther King Jr., which echoes the call to action of the Universal Declaration of Rights cited by Craig. Dr. King said that the ultimate measure of a person is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at the time of challenge and controversy. And in that spirit, I'm honored to be able to participate in this event today with so many outstanding men and women whose work is so inspiring. Uh, uh, one note, we, we, we've received quite a few uh, 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 questions in the chat. Uh, we've been saving those uh, because of our uh, limited time and because we're already over. Uh, I'm, uh, have, we're gonna figure out a way to get back to you uh, with those. Uh, and but we will try and uh, at least cover some of those points, uh, you know, during this uh, segment. So, Fiona, I want to start with you on on a very practical level. Um, uh, could you um, bring everybody up? Uh, Thank you. Fiona, I want to start with you on a practical level. When we're telling these stories, uh, what actions and elements do we need to put in place to protect the story and keep our own teams and subjects uh, uh, safe? Well, I think um, 
first and foremost, if one is, um, you know, it's a lot, it's a real story of an individual, there needs to obviously be consent of the individual. Um, I mean, that's the foremost thing in, in, in dealing with any protection issue. The individual, their family, and having their consent in quoting them or having them starring or the story is the number one thing. And for example, we would never, even it comes to us, you know, we will only do an intervention with an authority that the government, if we have the consent of, of, of the individual. So Thank I think you. that's the key. Thank you. And uh, I wanted to, this is sort of a question uh, both for Chris uh, uh, as well as for Paul uh, relating to the use of educational support materials. It relates a little bit to some of the things that Bonnie touched on as well, which is uh, Chris, uh, in, in the educational uh, space that you, you were so articulate about before and particularly related to the uh, sustainable development goals, uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, sort of working with educational support materials, the sort of things that, that are brought uh, to, uh, uh, to support films? Uh, can, have you worked with those in some of your work? Um, I actually uh, posted something. I was I was having a I was trying to have a chat with uh, Bonnie, but I think I was having a chat with everyone. <laughs> but anyway, um, I was just saying that um, when you are um, in a classroom setting, when you're trying to um, tell students about what's happening in the outside world and trying to um, um, uh, incite them into action, the documents that you need, uh, obviously, in include documentaries of movies that have been made. The only problem is that most of the movies are usually very long. Um, so it's, it, it's always a big challenge for the people in the education system to get good clips and very catchy clips of what, um, what, what has been happening. But also on the other side, looking at it from your standpoint as producers, you, we also give you too many stories. We give you way too much information sometimes and you can't sift through it. So there's a, there's a, there needs to be an effort to like really um, understand how to reduce a big interesting story into a small capsule that can be digested very quickly by a director who is pressed for time, who wants to make this story and uh, wants to, to do it. That's why when I was telling you my story, it's very catchy, very quick. And then you can look at what is behind them. But for example, when I was, I was teaching at, and I, and I wrote this, I was teaching at the Southern University of New Hampshire uh, a, few, a few years, and I showed the film uh, Blood Diamond to my students every year. And many, many of my students say that's better than reading a thousand books. So I, I, it has in, in instant effect these materials that you use. And so it's really important for us in the human rights movement to show you these stories, just like the way my colleagues, um, Chetra, Ravina, and Fiona, and Craig before had showed the snapshots. This is really important. But we also need you guys who are doing the films to send us small trailers and snapshots so that we can also use them in uh, education system. I would just like to add quickly, William, to that's what Chris was saying. I think it's very important in impact campaigns to have both film discussion guides and curricula. And what we did at Amnesty with Blood Diamond, Hotel Rwanda, Constant Gardner, is we established relationships with LA Unified and other school systems. We gave them physical copies of curriculum, but also um, uh, we gave them downloadable versions so that teachers could use those assets. And it's been very successful on all of those campaigns. And so I encourage anyone in Impact Camp to develop those two assets. Yeah, and, and, and just to repeat, I, uh, with Selma specifically, they worked with uh, Teach With Movies, uh, uh, but also Journeys in Film. I know, Bonnie, you've worked with as well that does those uh, curriculum. Almost all my campaigns, yep. Exactly. They're fantastic. Exactly. And uh, uh, may I add, uh, I wanted to talk with you a little bit in terms of uh, the United States of Al, because you you did something that was very unusual, particularly for broadcast television, where you know sometimes after watching a show or whatever, you'll see a card that you know gives you a, a, you know a a, a follow up or an action step that will lead you to mental health resources, for example. But you really broke the fourth wall when you did essentially a PSA, uh, you know, for 
uh, getting support for bringing interpreters back to the United States. And I, that was that was quite unusual. And I thought you might speak to that a little bit in terms of that, that action step that you took. Um, th uh, thank you, Will. Uh, the, yes, I mean, I think we, I mean, for me, um, yeah, I've been doing this work for a long time. Uh, and, and I've done this with other people as well. You know, for a long time, what I would do is I would go in and work with studios and networks in trying to expand the story, the thing that's the core of the story beyond the screen into a conversation, right? Storytelling doesn't begin and end with the credits and the, and the, and the content. As Bonnie said, you need to do a lot of work because most of the people in the world, ultimately, even if you have the biggest film in the world, will not have seen it. But they will likely, in this era of social media, be exposed to the conversation around it and the trailer, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those things are an opportunity. And, and you can't do everything inside the story, right? The story has to have its own mechanics. It has to service um, and it has to work. Uh, but there is so much that you can do around the story. And I think it's really, really important that filmmakers and storytellers and studios and networks, because it's not just us, um, understand that and, and, and service that. And luckily with Warner Brothers and CBS, we've had an amazing partnership and, uh, and with my colleagues as, as well on the show. And so it's been very important for us, even though, even from the starting with the first season, to make sure that we leverage the position that we have to expand the conversation. Uh, we've been in conversation with organizations such as the IRC and, and the UN and, and others in trying to make sure that we understand how best we can impact. We went, you know, we sent our actors down to, uh, to Capitol Hill to, uh, to step on the, you know, on the steps of the Capitol Hill to ask the Biden administration to, ex to extend the zone so people can get through to the airport when um, things are very difficult. Um, we've done digital PSAs, broadcast PSAs, as many as we could do. We're doing one right now around you know, the, 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 the famine and the situation in, in Afghanistan right now. Um, so yeah, that's critical to us. Our actors have been on it and it's been very important to them. And so uh, I think what it's been so nice to be in this position where I have this level of influence that I have to see the willingness of everybody to want to do the right thing, where sometimes from the outside, it may seem like that's not the case and you're pushing uh, upstream. And it, as I recall, uh, for the second season, you actually switched the first episode in order to address uh, some of those issues more directly head on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we, we didn't know, you know, we knew something was going to happen, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but we didn't know when, right? And there was a, you know, some of us thought it was later, some of us thought it was earlier. And, uh, but when, when the, the Taliban uh, took Herat and, uh, in Afghanistan, which is the, one of the, you know, the cities that normally are, are pretty much a holdout, we knew that this was going to happen pretty quickly. And by Monday, we found ourselves in a situation where um, half of our staff, as um, Danny mentioned, uh, our writer's room is uh, comprised of multiple Afghans, uh, military veterans, uh, spouses of a military veteran, and comedy writers. Um, and, uh, you know, our you know, they were thrown into a crisis where they had to get family members out. And, uh, and, and, and so we had to figure out how to tell the story. And we knew that we couldn't uh, just go with business as usual. And so we threw the, we said, all right, we're going to push the stuff we've been working on down season and begin to reimagine a new, new episode that actually tells the story of the fall of Kabul and use that as an opportunity to tell, the, you know, our characters who are now already part of the you know, part of the zeitgeist to tell that story to a part of this country, because who watches network television and on prime time, you know, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I, you know, I mention a lot is that, you know, you look at the media and you think it's, it's the distorts impact, you know, the succession uh, finale, which was the biggest talk of town had one and a half million viewers, we have 6 million viewers a week. Um, uh, and uh, so they and 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 so it was really really important for us to be able to take the 22 minutes of time we have on primetime television uh, to tell that story in a way that would navigate. It, it was a it's a very difficult story to tell, um, but to tell it in a way that actually would have an impact and and uh, and it's been amazing. Um, to, it was amazing to be able to do it. To be honest with you, thank you. And then to do these things around it as well. Yeah. And, and Erica, to springboard off of that, you've worked in a lot of different media platforms in addition to genres. Uh, it, have you found that there, you have a personal preference or that where you're sort of getting the, the word out, if you will, or, or calls to action that uh, you found most effective uh, in, in your work as a, a producer? Yeah, I think 
you know, uh, to, <laughs> to bounce off my head again, I think that comedy really goes a long way. And like, for example, when we were doing The Flight Attendant, it was really important for us to really tackle addiction and trauma. But when you've got Kaylee and she's so sparkly and you've got this fun, tight mystery, people, I think it would be much harder to get people to watch Leaving Las Vegas, right? Mm -hmm. Or to watch a heavier addiction piece. Whereas with this, they're having fun and then they're like, oh, do I drink too much? Like, yeah. you know, like, and I think that when people are opened up mm -hmm. uh, and enjoying themselves, it's easier to sneak in than yeah. sometimes when it feels like you're hitting them over the head with the message. Yeah, it's the, the classic of putting the spinach in with the popcorn. Exactly. As a mom, I relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> So and also, I just just could quickly add also the idea is that you want to show what is lost, right? Death on screen um, is not felt unless you see who it impacts and how it impacts. Exactly. Them. You know, addiction does not sell unless you can see that that person also has joy and life and vitality. And I think this goes to also the stuff we're talking about in human, human rights. I was in Sierra Leone during the Civil War holding a camera in Freetown when when it broke out. And I remember I was pointing a camera at a at a machete fight amongst young boys and men and I couldn't watch anymore and I turned my face around and I saw a young boy going to school and his mother sending him to school despite the fact that there were kids his age in that in that fight and and I said my camera's pointing the wrong direction yeah that's the story of Africa that's not being told mm -hmm. and and that's and that's what we mean I think you can tell the story of that kid who's going to school despite the fact that the civil war broke, broke out against him that's how you tell the story of civil war in, in Congo, uh, in Sierra Leone, for instance, not by showing the misery of how it costs, because only that shuts people off. Yep. So I just wanted to really add that to connect those dots. Uh, thank you. Uh, Craig, I wanted to uh, ask you a question that sort of relates to what I was posing to Fiona and her response was, what are the rules in other countries in terms of active legal cases or even uh, endangerment by subjects? Uh, have you had experience in, in, as an international lawyer, a human rights lawyer, in terms of that, you know, the, uh, working in other countries, because most, but certainly not all of the uh, people participating here today are from the U.S., but uh, uh, operating internationally, but what's been your experience in terms of uh, uh, filmmakers and storytellers navigating uh, the, the national laws in which, uh, in the countries where they're operating? I mean, it's really a good question. I mean, you will often find yourself in situations where the law is wholly inadequate to protect people. And that imposes, I think, a greater moral obligation on those who are going to intrude into what are, in, you know, in the end, matters of life and death, as all human rights questions uh, ultimately are. And so, I mean, I think Fiona started, off, started us off by talking about uh, consent. I think that has to be fully informed consent about what can be expected by the subjects um, uh, and what cannot be expected, including in terms of, of, of protection. I think it is important to take you know, special efforts. We have whole methodologies developed in the UN uh, on how to you know, respect rule number one, which is do no harm. You know, you're out there trying to help either by doing human rights work directly or as a filmmaker, bringing the story out. You know, the rule number one is, is, is do no harm. And that means that um, uh, you have to have methodologies in place that will protect uh, the people who have the courage to engage with you on, uh, on these questions. And it's usually the case that the law, the domestic law is, uh, is inadequate to, uh, to, to do that. So do no harm. Make sure you have informed consent, stay connected, follow up, take precautions in advance to ensure that you're not exposing people to undue harm uh, by, by engaging with them. Uh, and as I say, we actually have well-developed methodologies for our human rights monitors in, in doing that kind of work. And I think uh, creatives as well and filmmakers and others need to, to pay attention to those, those factors as well. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And and Bonnie, if you're still with us, I, I just wanted to sort of wind up this part of, of the uh, the workshop to uh, ask you a couple of questions in terms of uh, one of the most important things I think a lot of people who work in this area in, in, in the creative community ask is sort of measuring impact and outcomes and knowing, you know, whether you really made a difference. I mean, all, all of this effort that we've been talking about in terms of uh, creators and the years that go in often to, to making film and television uh, content, uh, but, you know, 
what in your experience have been the the indicia for sort of measuring the uh, the outcome? Uh, you know, whether whether things really landed. What what are the qualitative and quantitative things that you have looked for in your work uh, to say, you know, we, we really landed. We we you know, we can sort of say this was worth the effort. Well, uh, with every one of my campaigns, you know, I engage NGOs and we discuss with them and with the filmmakers, what are those advocacy initiatives? What are the metrics that we're going for? And so every one of my campaigns has to have those tangible metrics. And so, you know, um, with, for example, Food Inc., you know, uh, one of the initiatives that we were able to track on the metric side uh, was the fact that uh, you have menu labeling now. So, you know, when I used to go to Starbucks and order a tall mocha frappuccino with whip and then realized all the calories in there, that's no longer what I order. Um, but, you know, on, on the human rights front, um, with Hotel Rwanda, we wanted to, the ethnic cleansing campaign was happening in Darfur at the time. And, you know, we knew that it was going to turn into a genocide. So we needed to mobilize people around the world to take action to contact their government representatives to do something to help those refugees. And so we had, you know, that was a very successful campaign on the metric side for that. Um, and then with the movie Lord of War with Nicolas Cage, that movie, we worked with the UN and um, we advocated for the passage of a small arms trafficking bill, which was passed. And also on that campaign, which focused so much on child soldiers, Nicolas Cage donated $2 million for the rehabilitation, reintegration of child soldiers. And that money went to World Vision and also went to Amnesty to do our advocacy work around child soldiers. And when we went out with that movie and with certain initiatives asking people to become engaged, our server crashed because so many people wanted to donate. So many people were wanting to know how they could contact the UN, what they could tell their government representatives about addressing the issue of child soldiers globally. So I work very closely again with filmmakers. We define how to move the needle on certain issues. And with the grassroots organizations, we work together to accomplish that. Thank you. I really appreciate it. So I know uh, we could go on for another hour on this. We <laughs> It's such a rich and wonderful uh, panels we've had today. But in closing, I want to thank uh, all of the uh, uh, panelists and moderators and uh, our creative uh, community outreach partners from the UN and the UN Foundation for their informative and inspiring contributions today in the planning of this uh, event. Uh, and um, for members of our audience, we thank you for your participation and look forward to having you at our next event. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we will try and figure out a way for those of you who put questions into the chat uh, that uh, how we can get back to you in, in a specific way. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, all of your time and your uh, involved engagement today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next uh, workshop that we do uh, with our partners at the UN. Thank you so much.